Regenerative agriculture is a new hot topic, but there's a different perspective that Daniel brings where he questions some of the things that we apply. Being an understudy of one of my absolute heroes, Alan Savory, Daniel has a practical experience to share with us from his farm, from consulting, and all kinds of holistic views from Savory and the Savory Institute. All right, Daniel, really, really excited to have you on here, brother. So I uh, heard you on the Weston A. Price podcast, and you had uh, some interesting takes that were a little maybe uh, contrary to what a lot in the regenerative ag space think. And, uh, you know, to follow that up, your experience with Alan Savory is big. So uh, one of my friends, Jared Lumen, has the Herd Quitter podcast, and Alan was on there, uh, and that podcast has so much wisdom in it. I think it's my favorite podcast of all time. And so really wanted you to elaborate, you personally knowing Alan uh, and the approach and going through what the Savory Institute does. Uh, if you don't care, just kind of like, you know, sh share what you have learned from him and what uh, that holistic approach to agriculture, what, what does that mean? Yeah, th thanks, Logan. It's a blessing to be with you. Um, thanks for reaching out, and I'm excited for the conversation. A Alan is a is a great place to start. Um, brilliant man, brilliant mentor, uh, has become a, a a good friend of mine. Um, you know, I did a podcast a, a couple months ago, and I, and I was asked the the difference between holistic management and regenerative agriculture. So some understanding and terminology back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, all the way until about 2005, 2010, Alan Savory, uh, a man and his wife, Jody Butterfield, out of Zimbabwe or Rhodesia, and then eventually Zambia and Zimbabwe, uh, had created, uh, really co-created with a whole network of just thousands and thousands of people, this, this protocol. Uh, it's a holistic decision-making framework, if you want to be technical, that's called holistic management. And uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion today. I think, you know, regenerative agriculture is on the rise. And I think this is a very good thing. I think better foods coming into communities is obviously a, a very abundant and nourishing and good positive thing. Um, but holistic management is, is, is not really standing against that, even in the slightest. It's, it's really a, the same vision, maybe different perspective. Um, but what holistic management says is that... Um, Results matter. It's true, right? So regenerative agriculture might be a, a particular a paradigm of thinking or maybe a practice or methodology where we're looking at soil health, we're looking at biodiversity, we're looking at increasing carbon in the soil, whether or not it's being stored or sequestered. We're looking at communities that is also biodiversity. We're looking at how minerals or nutrients decompose and cycle through the landscape. We're concerned with these things, and these things are obviously very abundant and beneficial. But what holistic management is coming in to say is, is that... Um, the paradigm behind that agriculture needs to change. Okay, the paradigm behind that agriculture needs to change. And, and I've said this in the past, and I'll say it here. Monocultures are nutritionally impoverished community systems, whatever you want to call them. As life participates in that monoculture, it becomes equally as deficient in life, as degenerative. So monocultures are, are more or less this virus that spreads, right? So as life participates in the monoculture, uh, whether or not it's corn, whether or not it's humanity, whether or not it's nematodes, it also decreases in its own literal abundance. And we see this societal, which we can talk about later if you want, if you want to talk about regenerative food systems. We see this uh, ecological, uh, if, if you want to talk about nematodes and herbicides and everything else. Um, but the point is, the way we look at nature, the way we perceive nature, and the way we understand our relationship as nature with that natural system, uh, matters. And as long as it matters, human decisions and the frameworks around those decisions matter. And so it, to a large degree, Alan has been just paramount in my wife and I's life. We run a 400 acre farm here in central Virginia. Uh, that's more or less our day job, if you will, holistic, holistically managed. And um, what Alan, I think, has been so pivotal in helping us understand is, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll say it like this. The, uh, 
I one time had the ability to sit Alan down um, a couple years ago. And I don't know, he's 85 or something at the time. Aged man. Uh, at the time, you know, it was unclear, you know, how much more time do we have with this unbelievable individual uh, on this earth? And uh, and we got to sit him down. We were a small group of people, a couple different uh, savory hubs. One, uh, Donna Colpatrick from Heifer Ranch, which I think is in Arkansas. Um, I don't know if you know Donna, but wonderful, wonderful person. We were we sat down. We said, okay, Alan, what is holistic management? Like, what is it in your own words? Like, you've written many books. You've talked for literally generations and and just, you know, decade after decade after decade. And, you know, according to the books and according to the published material, holistic management is a holistic decision-making framework to manage complexity. And, and that's fine, but it's a very academic definition, if you will. It works, but it's just very academic in its, in its roots. And I said, you know, what, what, what is holistic management? Tell us. And, and he sat there and he pivoted in his chair and it squeaked a little bit. And he, you know, fixed his hat that he always wears, this very English type, I don't know what you call it. Like I would, I would say like the Newsies kind of hat, if, if that makes sense. And he, he played with it and he, and he leaned forward and he said, um, holistic management is overgrazing on purpose. Holistic management is overgrazing on purpose. Now I say this, and to the agricultural among us, th this is deeply insulting, because if if regenerative grazing, if adaptive grazing, if holistic planned grazing, if management intensive grazing, rotational grazing, regenerative grazing, whatever you want to call it, if any of those beliefs, paradigms, methodologies, protocols, whatever you want to call them, stand for anything, they stand for a complete reduction or eradication of overgrazing. Right. And we can get into the science of overgrazing later if, if, if you feel like you have that desire. But holistic management is overgrazing on purpose. And the most interesting thing about holistic management is in order to manage holistically, you create a context, which is the vision for the future that you understand. And that vision corresponds or I really should say converges with the vision of the whole. Right. So Mother Earth has a vision. Right. And, and that, that's just a, a, uni, a uniformly accepted truth. Right. You have a vision. The tree has a vision. The grass has a vision. All life is moving in a direction for some purpose. That purpose is known to that unique individual. Um, and, you know, you also have a vision those visions converge in this marvelous, marvelous document called the holistic context. And you make decisions off of that. Right. And so the idea isn't that there's a per particular practice that regenerates or increases the ecological functioning of the earth. Rather, instead, it is our position within the functioning of the natural, natural world, maybe as the natural world that matters. And the decisions that we have within the visions that we may have within that singular system, which is composed of many holes, matters, right? And so in regenerative systems, you know, I, we run what's called the Rabinia Institute. It's a hub of the Savory Institutes in the mid-Atlantic here. Uh, of the United States. And, um, you know, we, we do a lot of consulting, a lot of training. Last year, we were on almost 100,000 acres of, of farmlands as consultants, mentors, designers, what have you. And so we see a lot of land. And it's so interesting. What I love doing with farmers is asking them, can we describe or identify one singular practice, agricultural pra practice that is universally regenerative on every landscape we can imagine? And I love it. I love the question because immediately, like whenever I ask it, my wheels start turning like, oh, I got, we got, we can think of something. There has to be some uniform uh, practice or protocol or methodology that is that that uniformly increases the ecological functioning of the landscape, any landscape over any time. And, and the funniest part is, you know, you can sit down a thousand farmers in a room. You're, you're never going to come up with one you're simply never going to come up with one because every system is different, right? Every tree is different. Every blade of grass is different. Every location is different. You can look at it scientifically. We can call it microclimates or unique environments. We can look at it more philosophically or spiritually and say that all life is animate and it has its own selfhood. We can look at it from whatever perspective we like to look at things. We cannot find a practice that stands above the unbelievably complex operations of our world. Right. And as long as that's the case, we have to manage with that complexity in mind, which requires a different perspective. Right. And that that that's holistic management as understood, or at least I, I think is understood, you know, by Alan and everyone else who practices.
so so you know there's there's a lot there and what really stands out is that uh, localism of focus and how it's different from maybe region to region uh, area to area based off climates and, and environment all, all the factors that go into it and so uh, that's a, that's a big need that we we kind of need to focus in on that uh, localism yes it, it well it's the application of the framework right how we make decisions is it, it's pretty uniform right we have a thought we, we weigh the options, we weigh it via some framework that means something to us, and then we act. And then we monitor that action, and then we react. And we monitor and we react. That, that framework is more or less just a very logical, sense-based framework. How the decisions are actually made, the visions that are had in the local communities, all of this is a local property, right? And, and it's, it's interesting, you know, it, there's so much to be said and so little time to say it. And so, you know, maybe to give it a quick highlight, it's it's interesting. The bigger regenerative gets as a term in the modern world, the more it it wants to be more like holistic management, and and not that holistic management is a particular thing. It just is. It's 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 an aspect of the earth. It's not owned by Savory. It's not created by Savory. I mean, the actual framework and its book form, I guess, is Allen's, but it it's not created by Allen. That that's a very important note. But as regenerative gets more central in in our modern paradigms, which I, again I think is a decently good thing. Um, it wants to become a uni universal property with local nuance. I think regeneration wants to become a universal property with local nuance. And we see this. And I mean, you can look at it however you like. The Farmer's Footprint, an organization uh, co-founded by David Leon and Zach Bush, Dr. Zach Bush, great nonprofit trying to do, you know, nonprofit-like things in the regenerative space. Um, they have an art not art show. I really don't know what to call it. It's not a competition. It's it's more just a celebration of local arts where everyone is 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 painting, depicting, sculpting, whatever their particular art form is, what regeneration means to them, right? So this is an example of regeneration being local nuance, right? What is the local nuance of regeneration to you, right? And we, we value that. But simultaneously, right, you have these large films on Netflix and Amazon from Kiss the Ground to Sacred Cow and many others, and then everyone in between that are trying to lay their finger on what regeneration means universally, right? Regeneration means soil health, right? Look at Kiss the Ground's definition in one of the leading uh, organizations around the regenerative movement out of California. Look at their definition online. And it, and it says it's the ability to grow, uh, uh, increase soil health and biodiversity while still producing food. And then look at the Rodales in, in Institute's definition of regeneration. And it says something very similar. We are trying to find this streamline, that is to say, universal definition of regeneration that extends over all places, but allow the local nuance to take form, right? But this is holistic management. This is the way life works, right? There's universal properties, right? Like CO2 is CO2, H2O is H2O, right? This, this, this is just a static form. Um, I mean, really gravity and, and, and the rate that uh, particular objects of a particular mass fall into the core of the earth, that is to say, gravity again, like it, it exists everywhere and that's a very fine thing. But uh, how we interact with gravity, how we interact with water, how we interact with the CO2 in the atmosphere or in the soil changes at, at, at nearly an infinite level as we get smaller and smaller and smaller locally, right? And, and so the point is we have this universal framework with localized abundance, that that's the key. You know, and on the Weston A. Price podcast, which is, you know, how we, we, we met each other, you know, I think I made it, hopefully clear. I mean, I don't know. At least it's clear to me. I may falter in my words, but I think localism is the only place we, we can go. You know, like technology here, it's allowing you and I to speak so abundantly with each other. You're in Arkansas. I'm in, the, I'm in Virginia. Um, while many miles separate us, technology gives us the ability to have a marvelous conversation. That said, when we're thinking about abundance, when we're thinking about nourishment, it can only be a local nuance. It can only be a local property. And, you know, I don't know if this rambling is interesting to anyone, but if you look at it scientifically, we also know this is true, right? And so from the ph philosophic, more emotional level of a decision-making framework that sees, you know, uh, cultural and ecological nuance at every stage getting higher and higher and higher as it gets smaller and smaller, that is to say more local, 
Um, you know, we can also look at this, that soil and, and the actual processes of, of the soil and the plant to soil and plant to soil to cow and plant to soil to cow to human relationship. And we only see localized process. So like everyone from Stefan von Villet uh, out in, uh, I think, the University of Oklahoma or Oregon, I, I can't recall, uh, all the way to Dan Kittrich and Fred Provenza at the Biological Food Association. Right now, there's scientists around the regenerative and nutrient-dense food space that are trying to associate uh, or, or trying to understand the relationship between nutrient-dense uh, foods to nutrient-rich soils, right? And they're trying to find the, the associative pathways, the relationships, whatever they are, the causes and the effects of we have this nutrient-dense food. How does that nutrient dense food compare to the nutrient rich or nutrient lacking landscape that it was grown in? What is the relationship? How do we understand this relationship? Because if we can understand this relationship, right, we have this deep insight into the operations of this whole new world, right? And the interesting thing is all of these scientists from Stefan van Villet in the West to Dan Kittrich to the Biological Food Association in the East, he's out of uh, Massachusetts. What we have is that the truly singular component of their findings thus far, they're only a couple years in, we still have so much knowledge to gain, but their singular findings is this, nutrients cycle locally, period. Nutrients cycle locally. So when a plant undergoes photosynthesis, it mines the soil for minerals so that it can catalyze the energy, right? We all think that energy is produced by photosynthesis. That's not true. The, 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 the inputs of, photos of energy is photosynthesis, yes. But plants are also sending roots down into the soil to mine the minerals, both macro and micro, some phytochemicals, tannins, endophytes, um, and, and saphenes, and many others, to actually catalyze that energy. So when a plant grows, it's taking nutrients from the soil and bringing it into its leaves. So if we were to take that leaf, cut it, and bring it elsewhere, right, we have a net reduction in nutrients and minerals in the soil in which that plant grew. Because the soil gave the minerals to the plant, we took the plant and gave it elsewhere. And so in order to understand nutrient-dense food, that is to say, in order to have nutrient-enriching food for humans to eat, we have to see food as a local property, right? The local human is eating the local cow who ate the local grass out of the soils that provided it its local nutrients so that all of these now can cycle back into the system and we don't have decreasing minerals, both macro and micro, both uh, primary and secondary compounds in the soil. But instead, we see them cycling through the soil. This is a regenerative system, I believe. But only if that is a regenerative system can it be a local system, right? And now we're back down to holistic management and the decision-making framework being a locally nuanced program. It has to be made at the local level. I mean, it, listen, I mean, I'll end with this and you can take the conversation anywhere, but it drives people nuts. Like when people want to learn holistic management, I get it, right? They reach out to the Savory Institute. They have a marvelous site, 10 times better uh, and has, you know, 10 times more money in it, you know, making it and such than our site ever will. And they reach out to Savory and they say, I want to learn holistic management. And Savory says, well, where are you? Because although holistic management exists, it really only exists locally. Like if you're in Virginia, if you're in the mid-Atlantic, right, for you to learn holistic management is for you to go to your local hub and learn it locally. Because only the local community understands the needs that are the physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, societal, whatever they are, of that community. And only that community knows how to nurture itself. And so, I mean, I, I, I know many, many people who get quite frustrated when they reach out to Savory and Savory says, find your local hub. But they are dedicated to the idea of decisions being made locally, right? It makes total sense. So, da Daniel, with what... What we do, and so that is the uh, farmer's market that, that we own, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, video traveling the state, doing uh, a lot of just the diving in to understand it, like experiencing agriculture. The uh, thing that kind of stands out is that we can't, can't differentiate between health and the connection with agriculture. And then when you start looking at health and you start looking at how poorly Arkansas ranks on on poverty, on health, on uh, you know, I mean, even even education. So there's a lot of things going against us from wh where we are, and it's really really hard to to distinguish where where the change is and where where 
you know, the, the discrepancies between, you know, Arkansas being home to these massive corporations, so Walmart and Tyson, J.B. Hunt, and then we have, uh, you know, the technocrats coming in and buying a lot of land like, like Bill Gates, and we, we have some sort of a disconnect there. And if, if you were, say, the secretary of ag for, for Arkansas and you were going to implement some policies uh, to, to make these positive changes that we need, what would be maybe that, uh, what would be that first step that you would do? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, if, you, if you give me the freedom, I'm going to answer your question and then I'm going to ask uh, and answer a question of my own that's very similar to it. And so I'll entertain your question first. If I was a secretary of agriculture, I would immediately, of any state, I would immediately make all uh, methodologies for food consumption, harvesting, transportation, retail, whatever, legal, with a big capital L, I, I would. Um, the, the last time, I mean, when you think about it from a regulatory perspective, the USDA, and this is by state by state, pretty well is uniform, very few states. Maine is the only one that I know of that, that differs from this. From a regulatory perspective, uh, in order for you to sell retail cuts of meat, so if I sell you one pound of ground beef, if you come to what, you know our farm and you buy one you know ribeye steak, it has to be processed in a USDA facility. The, the last time any consumer was poisoned from a lesser facility, that is food poisoning of any kind, uh, intense or not intense, was 2002, if I have my numbers correctly, and it was a minor case and it was one. Um, before that, it's unknown, right? And so uh, there's no track record for the USDA being needed in a small localized system. I mean, there's a plant in, in there's a food processing plant in Baltimore. Uh, I forget Cargill, Tyson, Bay. I have no idea the the company, but one one of the big you know meat processors, meat uh, aggregators in the in the world. Um, and uh, you know they process, I forget, a thousand beeves an hour or something crazy like that. I mean, our, our local, you know, custom exempt processor processes one or two cows a day, let alone, you know, 12,000 cows a day, if, if you do the math at a 12 hour operational capacity of the bigger plants. And so when you're looking at a small localized system, the regulatory system needs to become small and localized or just not existent at all. It at least needs to understand that the local, again, we're talking about localized nuance, the local nuance of a local community feeding itself locally does not require the same regulatory oversight as a big system feeding the world. It just doesn't. And then when you look at the bigger system, I, I, uh, I can't make this claim as, as, as sure um, in the sense that I don't operate in this system and I don't, I don't know it as well. But if you look at the numbers, um, uh, what is it? Uh, 34, the, the exact number is, lose, uh, lo uh, is, is lost to me, 35, 34% of all foods produced in, in the world uh, are wasted in the distribution system. So let's say a third. So a third of all cows harvested, a third of all apples, you know, picked, a third of all lemons harvested, like a third of it decomposes, right, uh, uh, too early in the distribution system. It goes to waste. And Farmer's Footprint uh, put out some data, and I'll let them be the, the source of the data. They can defend where they got the original source. Uh, if we were to resolve 25% of that food waste, so if we take 25% of the 30% of foods wasted, which if I do quick math is less than 10%. So if we just find a solution for 10% of the foods produced and just do it better, 10%, we would feed the entirety of every human alive today, first world, second world, third world, it doesn't matter, with enough calories to sustain a, a modern diet. 10%, 25% of 34% or whatever it is, less than 10%. Right. And so even when you're looking looking at the big systems that may or may not require regulatory oversight, it, it's still collapsing right in front of our eyes. So is the USDA and the FDA and all these other organizations dealing with the distribution of food doing a good job? I mean, obviously, mathematically, that is to say statistically, no. But we do know locally it's just unneeded. Right. Like our neighbor. You know, we live in a community at uh, Central Virginia. It's a community called Wingina, Virginia. Um there's about 109 of us that live here. It's an old forgotten uh, region. The local gas station is about 45 minutes to an hour away. The local grocery store is easily an hour. Um, it's an old forgotten rural community. Aged, like one neighbor is a second boat of Jamestown. The other neighbor is the original land grant from George I back in the 1710s or something like this. Just an aged community. And we all drive an hour to get our food. All of us to the local grocery stores an hour away. And, 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 it, and, and I don't mean to insult really many people uh, when I talk, uh, and, if, and if I do, I apologize, maybe, um, but there's nothing in between me and, our, and my neighbor, 
right? Like my cows graze my land, which borders his land. And if they need meat, why in the world do they have to drive an hour to the grocery store to buy meat that was raised in Montana? It doesn't make any sense. Most of the meat, even the regenerative meat, which is, you know, a great problem I have. I've done so many podcasts and gotten so many mean, hateful emails because of saying these things, but I believe it to be true. You know, we are buying these regenerative foods online and, and they're being raised in Montana, processed in Texas, shipped from Montana to Texas, from Texas to Virginia, right? And we're eating it and we're thinking, wow, look at us. We're saving the world. Well, no, we just made FedEx a bunch of money. And we made some, some, you know, large national food processor a lot of money, but our local farms are dying. Like our local farms are making on average in, in the, in the mid Atlantic here, $18,000 a year. They're farming around 80, 80 hours a week and spending about 30, 37 hours a week at the farmers markets. Right. And, and they're right next door. Right. But if you will live where we live, you have to bring your animals two and a half, three hours one way. It's a six and a half, seven hour round trip to the closest USDA processing facility so that I can sell my meat raised on my land, which has no disconnection to my neighbor's land, it's the same field, to my neighbor, right? That makes no sense. So if I was the secretary of any state, immediately I would deregulate all local food sales. If you're raising meat and you're selling it to your neighbors, just do whatever you want. Because at the end of the day, if they get sick from that meat, one, it's their decision. And if in the state of Virginia, weed and marijuana is completely legal. So if you can smoke a blunt, you can easily eat a pound of ground beef that you process. I don't understand the difference. But also in the state of Virginia, you can process 20,000 chickens in a hole if you would like. Literally dig yourself a dirt pit, process 20,000 chickens, and sell them all retail. It's totally legal with a capital L. But if you process one beef and sell it to your neighbor, it's illegal, and you could find hundreds of thousands of dollars. This makes absolutely zero sense. I gave a presentation to the Virginia Department of Agriculture, the Secretary of Agriculture, really, and the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services last year. And I asked him, I said, why can you process 20,000 chickens in an unregulated system, but I can't process one cow? And they have no answer. And I left and I thought to myself, it's, it's just the lobby. The chicken lobby is just worse than the beef lobby. That's the only difference. And if we are living in a country where the lobbyists, that is to say money, is, is, is absolutely controlling the outcome of our ability to live, Right, because if you and I stop eating, we stop living. Let's just cut to the chase. We can talk about food being a right or not a right. I don't really care. If we stop eating, we, we stop if, if we stop eating, we stop living. And so now if the lobbyist, that is to say big money, big tech, big pharma, big ag, is controlling the way that you and I are able to live, we only have a finite amount of time left. It's it's just the end of the story for us, in my opinion. So if I was a secretary of any state, I would absolutely deregulate all local meat sales. Because the transparency and the traceability is just unequivocal. Yeah, that, that's, that's the main reason. It's not because USDA is bad. It's, it's, it's not because USDA facilities or whatever are, are, are evil places. It's just it's traceable, right? If you go to McDonald's, I, I read a paper the other day, 300 far, or cows are represented in one McDonald's cheeseburger. 300 cows of 300 unknown sources from some unknown processing vat right? Of just a gargantuan size of meat. But if you buy meat from your neighbor, I mean, it's, it's, it's one farm. It's your neighbor. It's one cow. It's the cow that you heard mooing this morning at sunrise. I mean, it's, there's traceability and, and, and transparency throughout. Now, I, I said I would do two things. The first thing was answer your question, which I hope I did. The second thing I would like to say is I will never be <laughs> the secretary of agriculture of any state. Um, I, I, I think, I think localism is a term that I, I will be on. I absolutely did not create this term. Uh, I took this entirely from Vandana Shiva, a brilliant thinker. Um, if you're listening to this, you don't know who that is. Go on Instagram, buy her books, listen to her uh, podcast, documentaries, everything. Just pour into Vandana Shiva's wisdom and brilliance. But I, I think localism is a really ingenious property which allows us to do what other thinkers have been desiring to do for a very long time. And so I also don't own any of these thoughts either. Like uh, Chris Newman at Sylvan Aqua Farms in Northern Virginia, he has long been arguing to de-individualize the local farming movement or the farming system in, in general. We need to de-individualize. And, and what he's saying, what, what, what Vandana Shiva is saying, what all these other thinkers are saying, and all I'm doing is reiterating, it, it's that in localized system, you don't get to know your farm. You get to know your farmers. You get to know your farmers. It's always plural. If you are a human being today, you're a consumer, you're not in agriculture, maybe you visit your you know, open air farmer co-op type farmer's market. Um, that's just so exciting to hear is existing over there in Arkansas, right? When you show up, it's ridiculous to think that one farm 
has a complete top-down monopoly over that entire system. It's, it's ridiculous. You, you can never actually do that and make it work logistically or ethically, right? And so when you're putting food in your body, we have to realize that a whole s slew of life goes into that, right? You had the nematodes in the soil that ate the, ba that ate the fungi and the bacteria that cycled the nutrients, that poops out plant available nutrients. Like the, the nematodes, right, are as crucial into that system as, as you, Logan, are, as the, as the you know, the, the builders who built the, the, the store for them to be purveyors. I mean, like the n amount of life going into the consumption of food is so entirely massive that for us to say we should know your farmer, I mean, it's laughable. It, it, it shouldn't even be considered. You, you, you have to know your local farmers, right? It takes a community of people to have communion in the commons like that. That's that's the only way this happens. And um, localism, I think, is, is the only way forward because it, one, its natural limit is people. We need, or I shouldn't say people, life. Let's be a little bit more broad and much more holistic. Its natural limit is life. How much life can we put in the system, right? But if you were to go to a, a, a Purdue processing plant today, what's their limit, right? It's how much space they have, how much freezer space they have, how many, you know, freezer trucks are coming in and coming out of the system. It's the size of their you know, big, long, half a mile long, you know, chicken house. It, it's a, it's a very, very fake and modern and, and I, I, I don't mean alien, but like extraterrestrial, but it has no foundations in the actual operations of the earth, but in a localized food system, which is to say in a local community, what is the limit? We need more life, right? It, it, it's, we don't need more fossil fuels. We don't need more road systems. We don't need better distribution systems. We don't need more USDA processors. We just need more life. Right. Like right now, our little community here, we're trying to determine if we can do some grain systems that are all cooperative within the community. So we just rotate from farm to farm and we cultivate five acres of einkorn wheat, you know, and the whole community plants it and the whole community harvest it because we all need wheat. Right. And so it's absolutely ridiculous to think that one single farm can produce all of the wheat for 109 people. But we all have land. We all have hands. And we all love throwing big parties with a lot of food and a lot of beer and a lot of other alcohols. And it's just, let's have a big wheat picking party. And that's health, right? That's a localized system. It needs more life. But in addition to that, there's no regulatory oversight over a localized system. And, and, and I'm not saying do illegal things. At least I'm not saying that here. But like, nobody is standing in your way from doing what I'm describing, right? No money is needed. Right. Everybody brings their own food to the potluck during the harvesting party. Right. And if you're winnowing it and we're using a box fan to winnow the einkorn wheat, everybody has a box fan. We don't have to go out and buy some two, three thousand dollar winnowing. Fan. Like everybody just bring a box fan. Right. We all have the 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 nutrients. Right. The life required to run localized communities. We just have to start. Now, there's obviously failures, right? If you live in downtown New York City in a, you know, condominium in, in Brooklyn, like my brother used to, and, you know, he would always say, Daniel, what you're saying is interesting, but what am I supposed to do? You know, and that's a different conversation. Well, it, it starts with one, we have to question why you're living in a condominium in Brooklyn. But if, if we can't tackle that, <laughs> well, yeah, okay, fine. We need to start developing localized communities in city centers of urban gardens. There's plenty going on. We need to start rallying the farmers just outside of the city center to understand that the people inside the city desire their food. Like, let's start building a localized community. It might look different, but the philosophies, the paradigms, the true source of life being life, it's still there. Right. It's like holistic management. It's one singular framework looked at via a localized nuance of, of, of complexity and and localized visions and ideals and vision like practices and such. It's the same thing. Like we live in the middle of nowhere. It looks a particular way. If you live in Brooklyn, you live in the middle of somewhere and it's going to look a different way. But humans working together as 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 old as the, you know, homo species, it's as old as we are. And, and if that's the solution to the world, um, the world's modern crisis of technocracy and political oversteps and overregulation or what have you, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, man, with all, all of that, I think that it's so important to understand that we all have roles, right? Like we uh, as a producer, as an aggregator, as a, you know, the retail, we all have these roles, but none of it matters if we don't have the consumer participation. So, like, what would be that very first thing? What would be what would be the consumer's next step? 
to help uh, make all this work? It's a great question. Again, I will defer to a friend of mine who I think said it so much more brilliantly, but I will give it to you because it's perfect. Uh, Precious Piri uh, is a wonderful friend, uh, an indigenous woman from Zimbabwe. I asked her how, how long her family has been there. And she said her family emigrated to Zimbabwe from South Africa 3,000 years ago. And she thought that was recent. So I, I giggle. You know, my, my grandparents came over to America from uh, Croatia and, and, and Ireland. And I, I, I don't know, just totally different perspective, if you will. But I, I asked her, I said, I said Precious, um, because they're, they're dealing with genocide. Um, she was orphaned as a child, lived literally in fields, scavenging and harvesting mushrooms just to stay alive. I mean, her story is, is just unbelievable. And she's still in that community, still doing unbelievable work from the community perspective. I mean, her story is just, I mean, it, it's simply awe-inspiring. And I said, Precious, what do we do? Like, same question as you, you know, what, what, how can we help? What, what, what is we as modern humans, especially living in, in the United States, this strange first world type country, you know, what do we do to help? And she said, no, 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 that's the wrong question. And she says, please don't come over here and help. She said, what you need to do is look down at your feet and start there. Look down at your feet and start there. And, and I've totally taken this one step further, uh, but it's still her, her wisdom. And, and that's how I would like to respond to you. I mean, if you're a consumer and, and you're wondering what to do, I think we should listen to Precious. Look down at your, your feet and start there. And, 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 and what I think that means for us is find the most close farm possible. Don't go online and look for regenerative farms. Don't go online and look for, you know, certified organic farms. Don't go online and look for verified regenerative farms. I don't care. Don't do this. Find the most closest farm possible where there's a farmer in the field doing something, right? Like if you go to a Tyson chicken house, I've been to plenty of these things. No farmers are there doing anything. I mean, no, nothing's happening. It's just chickens are in a house and they're clucking and, and dying and eating each other. But nothing is really happening from a human perspective. Find the closest farm where a human is present, right? And and call them, email them. They're busy. Don't just take their time, but but visit them after, you know, setting up a time and just ask, how can I help, right? Because a lot of people, I've been farming for a really long time. We're just a local farm selling locally, hundreds of, you know, local consumers and families fed. I've dealt with, you know, many farms, managed many other farms uh, as well, and, um, and I would say most people believe two things, consumers, that we vote with our dollar and that all farmers want me to buy their stuff. And both of these two things are false. I, I, I don't want to say voting with your dollar is entirely false, but my issue with this phrase is he, he if this is true, he who has more dollars wins, right? Because a, a vote is to do something, right? And if you're voting with your dollar and I'm voting with my dollar, yet I have a million and you have one, I win. And now he who is richest wins. So in some sense, Bill Gates is voting with his dollar and he's winning in terms some in, 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 in the game that he has created and he is playing. And so number one, don't think that it is a money spend. I'm not even asking you as a local consumer asking, what do I do? What is the first step to spend money? Don't, don't even spend money. Create the relationship, find the local farm and ask, how can I help? Because over the last 10 years, we've consulted on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of landscape. We've transitioned thousands and thousands of acres of land, um, you know, from corn, soy, and wheat to perennial grasslands of just waving gorgeous, you know, pastures and meadows and civil pastures and such. I mean, we've, we've done a lot and I've never met a farmer, conventional or regenerative permaculture or, you know, feedlot, um, that looked at me in the face and said, I love degeneration. I love erosion. I love killing people with these chemicals. I, I love that, you know, I have cancer at 40 years old because of X, Y, and Z. Like, I've never met this farmer. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they exist. I've never met them. And so speaking from my own experience, I will say that I've never met a farmer that wanted to be degenerative. They just didn't have the tools. They didn't have the paradigms. They didn't have the financial uh, backing to go to the weekend grazing conference, right? I mean, like there's something missing from their lives, from their own communities that is stopping them from undergoing that transition. Maybe they need someone to say, because transitioning is hard. You get into a land transition project from corn, soy, and wheat over to a perennial sward of grasses, and you will go through a three to five to 10 year, depending on the size and a couple other factors, period of time where you make no money, right? It's very hard. It's very hard to transition. And so maybe what they need is for you just to be there. Hey, help us transition, fund some of the transition, right? What, whatever it is, maybe during the transition, they're not going to be selling certified organic produce. 
um, because it has to be, you know, three years away from spraying these herbicides and pesticides and such, glyphosate being the, the strongest pesticide they would spray. And um, and they can't find a, a, a local uh, um they can't find a local shop where they can sell their non-organic but organic vegetables. So maybe you buy those. I mean, like the, the nuance here is infinite. We can talk for days and days, if not years and years, about all of the variations possible. But just show up to the farm and ask, how can I help? Maybe they need help pulling weeds. Maybe they need their fence line cleaned. Maybe they need $300 to go to the local, you know, grazing field walk that Alan Williams is putting on in Northern Virginia. I mean, like what they need is unknown. Don't believe that to support your local farmer, you have to buy meat from them, right? That makes no sense, right? But find the closest farm and ask, how can I help and see where it goes? And I will say, if you're listening to this and you are agricultural, the first step that I would tell you is start cooperating. Like I said earlier, it's ridiculous to believe that one farm can feed anyone. There's a network, a collaborative, a cooperative farms that need to come together to work together, right? But also to work together in feeding their local community. And so for one farm to exist as a rugged individualist, a silo all by themselves is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, Joel Salin at Polyface, they're 45 minutes to our west and all they do is need help, right? So like even the biggest among us, right? The most famous farmer in the world still needs help. And if he does, you do. And so the point here is if you're a farmer and you're not a consumer and you wanting to know my humble opinion of where you should start, Build a cooperative. It doesn't need to be official. Just start working together. Start bartering, right? Start letting things emerge. Start trading livestock. Start helping other farmers. Help them harvest. Like we're going to harvest a um, um, a bunch of uh, poultry on one farm that's just new to farming. They have no equipment and the community's coming together to help them harvest. And it's just unofficial. I'm not saying it has to be official, right? It's just start working together. If you believe that we can co-create a more beautiful world in a siloed, rugged, individualist society, it's never going to happen. Right. There's a lot else that we have to figure out, but coming together is a good first step. Thank you for that, man. Like, um, so where where does somebody come to find more about, uh, about Daniel and the farm and the consulting and all that that you do? What uh, what what should we or where should we send them? That's a great question. Um, we make this very easy on folks. If you just go to my personal website, all of the links are there um, to all of the different organizations that would host these questions or services or products. Um, it's just my name, Daniel Firth Griffith.com. And, uh, same thing for Instagram. If you go to our Instagram, Daniel dot Firth dot Griffith, I think is what it is. You can put it in the show notes or something. Um, you'll also get links to all of the other organizations. I'm, I'm really appreciative to the, the twist instead of just kind of going with the flow of what everybody else is saying, you're actually bringing up some really incredible like ways to question and, and view it. And I think that's awesome. So man, thank you. Thank you for the time and sitting down and, and sharing with us. Hey man. Thanks Logan. I appreciate the time. It's been fun. The constant pursuit of knowledge, of solutions on what we can do to apply these lessons from, you know, experts across many different fields and different areas of the world is, is what we're all about. And so please uh, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. Check out the Sewing Prosperity Institute. We take a much deeper dive into what is actually being said through the podcast and you know some of our interpretations of that and so being a part of the sewing prosperity institute is a way to actually you know participate where, wherever you are in uh, it, it takes a lot of money to produce these kind of content to put it together to travel to bring in experts and so that little bit of a membership actually goes a really really long ways to making the mission be a success. Thank you for listening to the Sewing Prosperity Podcast. We hope that you have learned something new and that you are inspired to adopt regenerative practices in your community. Remember that by working together, we can create a sustainable and abundant future for ourselves and for future generations.